Hello, puppies and kittens. I'm interviewing another author today. Uh, as you know, I've, I've uh, interviewed a handful of uh, book writers over the last couple of years or so. Most of the time, I've managed to find time to read the books, and I feel like a complete cheat that I wasn't able to do so this time. And I want to because the reviews are shining, and what I have read of it, this is the thing that I notice, uh, is that the book is very intelligently written. That was uh, that was the way that a number of other reviewers had put it, and I agree with what I've seen. We are talking with Alice Gretchen. She is an actress, writer, and the founder of Dare to Doubt. I'm going to ask her what that is in just a moment. But today we're talking about uh, what I, I think the title is, A Memoir of, well, of Wayward Spiritual Welfare and Sexual Purity. Of course, it just goes by the name Wayward. Uh, and Alice, good to meet you. Uh, would you please tell us a little bit about, let's start with Dare to Doubt. What is Dare to Doubt? Thank you for having me. So daretodoubt.org is a resource site that I created to help other people in the process of beginning to doubt or detach from their belief system. Uh, usually it tends to be a, a religious belief system, but I do have a few resources up there for people leading uh, cults of different kinds, like corporate cults, for instance, or political cults. So it's not exclusive to religion, but that is the main focus. Um, I have resources that you can look up by your belief background. Sorry, let me turn off my mail app. <laughs> uh, or by your immediate needs. So for instance, um, there's, a, there's a quiz that you can take on the homepage of the website. Uh, if Say you've been kicked out because your family just found out you're gay. If you're needing uh, to find a domestic shelter for safety, you can look that up there. Or if you're um, from the Muslim world and you're fleeing a forced marriage or honor-based violence, you can find resources there under the crisis care page or the Islam page. So really my goal with Dare to Doubt was to make it just a little bit easier for people who were either in uh, high stakes crisis situations or who have just been out of religion for a long time and maybe are just beginning to process like, what the fuck was that all about? Uh, just to be able to find a starting point of, of uh, other people, groups, mental health professionals, aid organizations. Um, there's so much support out there for people that uh, was not there when I left Christianity about 13 years ago. Uh, since then, since the, the mid late 2000s, there's been a boom of resources of people working in this space with other helping other people um, deconstruct is the, the popular term a lot of people use. Uh, but basically, um, whether you're just beginning to doubt or you've been a closeted atheist for a few decades, uh, there's probably something on daretodoubt.org that you could find that might speak to you and, and help you through, even if it's just knowing you're not alone. Do you network with, uh, or how much do you network with other like-minded groups? Ooh, that's a good question. Not not too much, actually. I've I've been doing a lot virtually. Of course, since since COVID happened or the pandemic locked everything down almost a year ago now. I live in Los Angeles. Um, there's been a lot of online networking and certainly the social media space. Uh, I've done a lot of networking in the two years that I've been running Dare to Doubt. Um, I have Twitter accounts and an Instagram account for it. And through, through those two, I've gotten to meet and connect with some amazing individuals and organizations. But as far as real life meetups and, and networking, I have not gotten to do a whole lot of that, um, in large part because Dare to Doubt was really starting to, to get some more traction during this pandemic time. So uh, I have not gotten to go to a lot of the conferences and, and meetups that I would like to, but. Well, I wasn't actually talking great. about in person. I, I mean that oh, there okay. are, there are organizations <laughs> that like where you, you're talking about, you dare to doubt it from what I'm get, gathering from it is that it's a general uh, uh, idea and like, like more general than just being specific to religion. You're talking, you mentioned corporate cults and I'm terribly curious what a corporate cult is, <laughs> but for the people that are, that are specified to religion, there's, there, there's a wide range of things like, um, uh, what is it doubt or grief beyond belief is is one organization yes. for you know that that would that would be networking with uh, an organization like yours uh, there's a number of others that that, that, that their names escape me yes. at this moment but i mean they're, they're, we can have quite a network of people that end all and all entirely virtual you know yes. pointing each other to resources and, and such and what is a corporate cult so a corporate cult. So first of all, defining a cult is a very dangerous undertaking, everyone. It's a loaded word, and perhaps rightly so. Um, 
but for for the purposes of this conversation, we're just going to use the colloquial term cult, even if it might be more PC to say a, a destructive group or a new religious organization. Everyone knows what a cult is. Um, so in a corporate sense, uh, there's Another definition for cult might be a high demand group. Um, a lot of corporations might have very unreasonable and unusual expectations of their employees to like live, breathe, and work the corporation's values, which are very clear. Um, questioners or dissenters are can be very shunned or threatened with job loss. And then two, two, there, there's a spectrum of destructive behavior, right? Um, cult expert Steve Hassan has a pretty helpful. Uh, visual for that that is on the dare to doubt cults page to kind of self-assess like is your group whether it's corporate or religious where does it fall on this do you feel like your questions are welcomed or do you feel shamed do you feel silenced do you feel um threatened do you feel trapped like there's any any group can turn toxic uh and i think in a corporate sense it's a lot more socially acceptable to have um certain expectations that uh, and certain practices that can be can be considered by some to be very brainwashy. Uh, I'm not from a corporate background, so I don't want to. I want to be careful here. I can't speak too personally to this experience because my background's in the entertainment industry, of which there's cults of an entirely different kind, <laughs> um, <laughs> like acting class cults, for instance. Um, but yeah, in a in a basically. Any group can turn destructive and culty, and it's it's a very individual threshold for what that might mean. Let me let me suggest that uh, you know we, we certainly in media we we have a lot of things that would I think qualify as cults when we when our information sources are not only uh, very exclusive and tell you not to listen to other people, not to get both sides of the story, inform the people that they, that they are being informed and that they're getting both sides of the story, they're getting the real news, and they don't need to look anywhere else. They don't need to ask anybody else. Anybody else is just lying to you. All of the rest of them are fake news. Mm -hmm. You get all your news here. And what you'll really get here more than information is opinions. You'll get our opinions and we won't leave you room for any other opinion, but you're not supposed to pay attention to that part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just, just consume what we want to feed you. <laughs> uh, and if you deter from that, if you deter from the prescribed sources of, of uh, information, you're kind of flagging yourself as a person not to be trusted um, or to be alienated. And that's that's dangerous. And I'm sure we're all familiar with seeing a lot of that play out politically in, in the United States. You know, it's a very, very polarizing time. I don't want to get too redundant. I know everyone's so sick of talking about the fucking election and all of it. But <laughs> but point is, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, behaviors that have concerned me from from both sides the extreme left and right wokeism a lot of people have argued is is a cult uh, or just a different belief system and it's um i think that there are some compelling arguments for it well i i have equal animosity toward the centrists and when mm. you say well their problems are both sides well what are you in the middle mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah pick a team <laughs> <laughs> fair enough fair enough <laughs> Okay, so so when you're talking about how uh, any dissension will flag you, right, and and can cause you to go down that further road, I think I think I mean I, I love deconversion stories. I love hearing the story of how people came out of their religious beliefs. Have you noticed that when the the stories that people tell for how they got into the religious beliefs, kind of always are repeating the same theme? You know, I was mm. face down in the gutter. I was a coke addict, mm -hmm. or heroin whore, or whatever. And so, and so I finally ran out of options, ran out of money for the thing that I would like to be addicted to, found an addiction that's for free, switched one addiction for another one, and now I'm addicted to that. So, but the deconversion stories are always wildly different. It's always complete, something completely different that, that caused the chink in the armor. And sometimes, or, uh, often in fact, it may be that that first dissension that first caused a conflict, that first time you said, I don't understand. Can you explain? Yeah. Like for me, it was when I was eight years old, and I and I knew that water was H two O because that's the first chemical everybody knows, right? What what child doesn't know that H two O? I didn't yeah. know what the chemical composition of fruit juice or alcohol were, but I knew that wine was fruit juice and alcohol, and so 
I asked the, the, the person telling me how Jesus turned water into wine. I said, well, how did he turn the oxygen or hydrogen into whatever alcohol is? And H2O kind of threw her for a loop. That was too advanced chemistry for her. She started screaming, how dare you question God? And, <laughs> and the, <laughs> so, so for you, what was, what was that, that first moment that flagged you? Mm. Well, first of all, I love your mind. I love that that's where your little eight-year-old mind went. Uh, <laughs> I was also a very naturally curious kid who was just like, wait, something's not adding up. So my first, I would say my first moment of doubt, and I write about this in, in Wayward, actually, I was seven, so around the same age, the, the age of reason, is, as I think Catholics call it. Um, I was not Catholic. I was non-denominationally Christian, but the media today would call my family evangelical or charismatic. Uh, so my first moment of doubt, I was seven and my family lived in Rockford, Illinois. So very Midwest. Uh, my parents at the time thought it would be a good idea to uh, broaden our spiritual horizons by attending a bunch of different churches and different denominations, which I appreciate that kind of well-rounded approach. That's dangerous. Um, it is dangerous. It is. Uh, they, but yeah, they're, my parents are very unorthodox in, in many ways, which we'll get to. But anyway, we were at this Baptist church and there wasn't a Sunday school for the kids at this church. And so I was like in the pews with my, with my parents and my four younger siblings, although I think there were only three younger siblings at the time, um, three or four. And well, you were uh, only seven. So how many could there be? Well, my, my youngest sister was born when I was seven. So I can't remember if she was already born or if she was on the way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're all about two years apart pretty perfectly. Um, but yeah, I the, the pastor uh, based his sermon on the story of how his two-year-old daughter suffocated to death in a, in a dry cleaning bag. And he was crying, like just like sobbing up there on the pulpit. And I was so shook. I, I started crying and my mom was like, it's okay. It's okay. I remember my mom trying to comfort me. And I was just like, this is, this is not okay. Because he tied in this story with his sermon about Job uh, in, from the Bible. And for those who don't know, Job is the poor soul that God decided to let Satan torture and torment just so God could prove to Satan that Job's faith was going to be solid no matter what Satan threw his way, which included the loss of his family and disease and so many other ailments. And I was just horrified by this story and that God would kill someone's kids just to prove a point to Satan when this God, I was taught that God was like all loving and all powerful. So that was the first time in my, in my mind that I can remember being like, wait, this, this cannot be like, God cannot be both all loving and all powerful and let something like this happen. That That's not making sense to me. And I asked my parents about it when we got home. I was like, so for some reason, it was just, it was always like stories of extreme suffering that really rattled my faith the most. The other stuff, the inconsistencies, the contradictions within the Bible, the other stuff distressed me, but I could let it go. What I couldn't let go was seeing people suffer and, and think that there's a loving God that could have intervened and chose not to because he works in mysterious ways, because it wasn't his will. And my dad told me about that story about the little girl with the dry cleaning bag. God must have wanted her up in heaven with him. And it's like, well, then why, if we were all in heaven with God before we came here, did we even fucking come here? Was like the outrage that was in, in my heart. And I didn't really have a huge vocabulary to, to express my thoughts as eloquently to my parents and my, my arguments. But um, yeah, that was the first time that I really was like, wait a minute. Like th there's something not right about this God story. Something you know, very deeply wrong that I, I came I away what I love about what's wrong with the, with the Job story is that the whole point of it is to praise being unreasonable. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> Man. Yeah. I, I, I remember my takeaway just being like, look, either God, either, either my dad's lying to me uh, that, that, you know, God just wanted her up in heaven and we don't get to know his ways or God's just not all loving. Oh, and then and at the end, you know, uh, God gets to use the excuse, and he does, that the devil made me do it. Yeah. <laughs> and God made the devil all-knowingly, right? So uh, the, the, these types, yeah, these, these were the types of doubts that I just 
had. <laughs> so you might appreciate this being in the entertainment industry that again, when I was a little boy, I don't remember what age, but I, I remember very young. I was five to 10, somewhere in there. Uh, I remember asking my mother about this, this Satan character that they brought up all the time that he's like the adversary, the one that, but even though it, it, you know, God clearly orchestrated all of this mess, but somehow Satan is the one that gets the blame for everything. And I remember asking my mother, what's the devil's motivation? Mm, what did she <laughs> say? I don't remember that she ever had an answer. She didn't understand the question. You know, ah. she, I remember her saying something like, well, you know, he's evil. He wants your soul. But why? What does the devil get out of this? What is the devil working for? And, you know, very often when you hear anything about the devil at all, it's just like, you know, just somehow it's like that, you know, the devil never read the Bible. You know, they say, spoiler alert, that, you know, God wins. And the devil doesn't know this. The devil hasn't written or hasn't read the book that's about him. I find that hard to believe. I find all of it hard to believe. But anyway, so you get on your, your first that was the, your your first uh, flag moment. Um, I'm interested to hear about other chinks in the armor. So, I, so other chinks in the armor that happened when I was about seven years old, and I I became a very diehard Christian, like totally sold out warrior for Christ. Uh, all through my teen years, uh, the the chinks in the arm, the, the further chinks in the armor didn't really reveal themselves until my late teens. So. Uh, long story short, I moved to Los Angeles by myself when I was 17 to pursue acting because I believed it was what God was calling me to. And uh, I'm, having, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around that concept. Right. You're not alone. You're not alone. I had trouble wrapping my mind around that concept. And we can come back to that. Um, I feel like I feel like some of my answers just invite more more backup questions, but we can we can we'll put a pin in that. Um, so how, how I became an actor. Um, a guy from my Christian youth group uh, back in Colorado, where I moved to LA from, he also moved out to LA around the same time that I did. And we didn't really know many other people here, so we became really good friends. We'd never dated. And a uh, little side note, I, I was fully involved in what is now called purity culture. Uh, and for anyone who doesn't know purity culture, at least in an evangelical Christian sense, is um, far beyond not just having sex until marriage. It's it's way more involved in that. It's being emotionally pure, mentally pure, physically. Like all, I believed that God had called me to be completely faithful to my future husband and body, heart, and mind. And so what that meant for me was no dating ever. Uh, I was going to have a courtship at some point um, with the man that I would eventually marry. And I would know who the man was because God would confirm it through the spiritual elders in my life, such as my parents or my pastors. Uh, that was that was what the courtship book said would happen. And that is almost textbook how my, my love life played out uh, for a time being. So I'm 17, this guy from my youth group back home, he's three years older than me. He's 20. He just announces out of the blue one day that God's shown him that I'm his future wife. And yeah, <laughs> go ahead, have a laugh. Um, <laughs> so it, but you know, I can definitely laugh about it now, but at the time I took it dead seriously. I just believed him. Um, I did not question him. I was an extremely sheltered kid. I was homeschooled my entire life. I never hung out with people who weren't Christians. So all throughout my upbringing, um, this ideology was just constantly reinforced. And anyone that I did encounter outside of my belief system was through the, I looked at them through the lens of like, oh, they're unsaved. They need to be saved. Maybe God might use me to evangelize to them. So in my world, it was not at all uncommon for God to reveal big life-changing things to people like what job they should take, what part of the country they should move to, who their future spouse might be. And uh, furthermore, after this guy made this announcement, and he was a dear friend, but he knew I didn't date, we'd never dated or gone there or anything, um, he called my dad to ask for my hand in marriage, and my dad gives his confirmation from God that he heard too that this was going to happen. Uh, Isn't it funny how God talks to all these other people? Oh yeah, and never and often contradicts. 
<laughs> oh yes. <laughs> Often contradicts. Yeah. But you know, God, God never, people, people always say like, well, what about you? You know, like, didn't you hear anything from God? Why did, how did you go along with it? You're and just by, a girl. If this was just, the Bible exactly. story, you wouldn't even have a name. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so you, you know, you know, and a lot of people who, who have very religious backgrounds, they understand. Um, but for a lot of people who didn't grow up like fully indoctrinated the way we did, um, it's a mystery to them. And all I can say is like, look, by that time in my life, I'd never heard from God myself. I just assumed there was something defective about me or that I harbored some sin that kept the Holy Spirit from communicating with me directly. And I was so used to my life being ruled by the things that God told other people, um, especially men. And uh, it just felt like another thing of like, Oh, well, yeah, the books and my youth group teachings always said that, you know, while I was in my father's home, he was the head of our household and I was to submit to his leadership. And when I married, it would be my husband. Um, and so I just thought, oh, well, God didn't tell me anything about this because this is the beginning of me learning how to trust and submit to my husband. And that God confirmed it through my dad and also the guy's mom who um, the impression that I retain of her was she was kind of esteemed as something of a, a gifted prophet in, in our church community. And so those, those statements that they all shared held a lot of weight for me. And I just felt very trapped in it. It, it. it felt inarguable and I faked happiness. I totally went along with it. I totally Did you know lied. at the time that you were faking happiness? I mean, because I've done yeah. that I, without knowing it. I've done that too, but in this particular circumstance, I definitely knew I was faking happiness, and uh, I I felt like I had to because I didn't want my marriage to start off with my my future husband knowing that I didn't love him that way, and that I was anything less than excited to be marrying him. I just didn't want to start off on that foot, and I also, more than anything, I faked it because I was terrified of going against what I believed was God's will, because I'd never really disobeyed God before. I was a really obedient kid. I was very conscientious, as, as a lot of us fundy kids are and were. And so um, it's... So all you have to do is, you know, find some hot chick who's religious, tell her God <laughs> said... <laughs> <laughs> and you too can have anyone you want. <laughs> yes, I, I, I see how some, some people are taking notes, I'm sure. Yes, that's, that's, you know, that's how it was supposed to unfold, except for one important point. Um, mm. And this was the major chink in, in, the, in the unraveling of, of my faith eventually. Uh, even though I believed it and went along with it, inside my heart, I was so devastated and I felt so betrayed. Um, not only by the guy and my dad, but by God, because I'd fully bought into the purity culture promise that if I was faithful to my future husband and body, heart and mind, God was going to reward me with this epic love story, this incredibly romantic um, like honeymoon and and just uh, all of my little girlish dreams would come true and that I didn't even carry a attraction for this friend of mine just felt like it, it just it was so wrong and I just felt so betrayed and like I couldn't, I, I felt like I'd held up my end of the bargain and God was like, nope, you're, I'm, I, I felt, what I told myself was like, oh, God's showing me that sexual attraction is shallow. And I, that's why he's making me marry this guy that I'm not attracted to because he's trying to show me that character is more important and this is a good guy. And it's not like he was unattractive. It's just, I didn't feel that spark for him. And uh, I just, I, I just rationalized it the way so many of us are good at. And I was really good at rationalizing by that point. So after that, I would say that's, that was the major turning point for me. I was betrothed to him for two months and, um, his dad was like going to pay for our engagement party. And, uh, long story short, it was my mom who was the only one who said that she had not heard from God that I was supposed to marry him. And she could tell that I was deeply, deeply unhappy and lying about it. <laughs> and she just called me out and wouldn't back down until I finally admitted. I, I just crumpled into tears and I was like, no, I don't want to marry him, but I feel like God says I have to. And she was like, no, God's a God of love, not a God of fear. He wouldn't want you to do this. And I, I just Has thought, she read the Bible? No. My mom's <laughs> one of those many Christians. Did you know, I, I didn't learn this until I was building the Dared It Out website. 
Christianity is the biggest religion in, in the United States, right? But only 11% of American Christians have actually read their Bible. And my mom's one of those 89% who had not. Um, she's read select verses, you know, the ones that uh, spoke to her or maybe were inspired by inspired worship lyrics or were worked into a sermon. But no, like I, I did read the Bible cover to cover when I was 12. And so I felt like a better Christian than my mom <laughs> because like I actually... I care to research what I claim to represent. And I felt like if I'm going to call myself a Christian, I better be able to back this up and, and know my text and be able to speak about this intelligently if I'm going to be trying to save people so and convert them to my belief system. I better have at least a, a semi-solid understanding of what that belief system is. And so, yeah, it wasn't surprising to me. Women in the Bible, they don't marry for love. The men arrange it all. They're never asked. They're never proposed to. So it just, it really felt biblical and uh, just timeless to me, the situation in which I found myself. And men take wives because they're accessible <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> or, or because they're commodities in trade for cattle or something. Yep. And wives plural, like you said, it's, it's a, it, yeah, I, I breaking, breaking that betrothal off took a lot of courage for me because it was the scariest thing I'd ever done. If it hadn't been for my mom, I'd totally be married with several kids by now. I, Where do you I think he would have been? And I understand that you, you want to be sensitive to this guy who, you know, if he ever if he ever heard this, he would be offended that you weren't. You know, I, I, I can see that you're trying to be sensitive. We've all had these these moments where perfectly acceptable person, but you just don't feel that. Okay, get that. So so nothing against that guy, but um, I've been in relationships I shouldn't have been in. You know, and at some point I realized that, you know, this person is poison, that, mm. that, that, that it's just being in the relationship with this person is poison for me and we, we need to get out, mm -hmm. you know. So what, what if you had been in this religiously, Ordained. well, this religious institution, you know, uh, at, at where would your life have been? Would you have ended in divorce or what, what would have happened? You know, in my gut, I just knew I felt like I knew that I would have filed for divorce by the time I was 30 and that I would have had at least three kids whose lives would then have to be upended. I just felt like in my gut, I just could see my future and I could see that I was going to try to make it work. I could see that I was going to go through with it. I was going to marry him. We were going to have to have sex and I was going to produce his heirs for the glory of God. And because that's my role as a, as a female. And I knew that, you know, we'd go to church and I would hate it. I knew that I was, I was just bracing myself for about at least a decade of intense unhappiness. And I knew I would genuinely try with all my heart and strength, um, God willing to make it work. And I just knew in my gut, I, it was going to end at some point. And I, you know, I've, I've talked to the future you, <laughs> <laughs> I've, talked, I've talked to the future you a few times, a few different names, slightly different hair colors and so forth. Mm. But yeah, I've, I've met that woman so many times that, I mean, that it's, it's so common to, to get into a relationship, say, have your first child when you're 20 mm -hmm. in you're in what you think is going to be your permanent relationship. And then by the time you're 23, mm -hmm. you're not in that relationship anymore. And, 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 we, we see the same course being played out over and over again. And, and this is largely because uh, women don't have an understanding of their own agency. Yeah. And They're, men don't have a any idea of their own responsibility at that age either. <laughs> yeah. It's so, it's, we were so young and so many people get married so young. I know so many people from my youth groups uh, I, I grew up moving around quite a bit, but so I say youth groups, plural, but a lot of them married right out of high school and started having families right away because most of them were also involved and took purity culture seriously. And at the very least, didn't want to have sex before they were married if they could possibly have the discipline to, to make it that far. So they marry young and some of them have worked out and they're still, they appear happily married. I don't know the the intricacies of, of their relationships, but and I've lost touch with a lot of them, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think that there's many people who sacrifice their own agency, their own happiness, even unconsciously to just do what they believe is expected of them, whether divinely or by the people putting pressure on them in their lives. And I feel extremely, extremely lucky 
and grateful that I got out when I did. Um, I know because, one woman oh. that the memory is screaming to me right now. One woman who was very religious, thought that God was responsible for their marriage and thought that she was supposed to change her husband to, to, to make him into the man he needed to be. And that, that was God's purpose for her was to change him, which, of course, yeah. that didn't work. No. <laughs> and he, ne he never became the man he was supposed to be. And so they eventually ended up divorced over it. Uh, because that's the reality of it. If we could go a little bit more controversial. Yeah. Uh, we, we, you were talking about you were raised in this purity culture, and a lot of people, a lot of women are taught that they need to be pure and all like this. Well, what if, what if you're just not? What if you're so not? What, what if, what if, uh, uh, what if women are allowed to uh, go through their high school years or, or early college years, expect it? that they're going to, uh, that they're likely going to, if they want, you know, experiment and date and, and all of that. And then it's and from the family's perspective or from, you know, their, their friends or whatever, it's just, that's not a big deal. What if, what if women can be flirtatious, promiscuous or not? What, 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 what about that lifestyle? Where, where do we go from there? Oh, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> 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 Gosh, what you're describing, I'm like, Wow, this would have, wow, <laughs> like this sounds great. Where's this society? <laughs> I, I know they're out there. Um, you know, even in secular American society, you know, we've talked a lot of, in the past decade about like slut shaming. Um, there's still, even in, even in the secular American society, you see the, the influence of, of um, Christianity and other, other religions that still continue to shame women for being sexual beings. Um, for wanting to have sex from a young age, you know, like puberty kicks in for most of us around the average age of 12. That's how old I was when I got my period and started having like, I started masturbating, I learned, which I learned about through Dr. Dobson's book, Preparing for Adolescence. Um, I don't know if you know Dr. James Dobson, a focus on the family, but that his, his book, Preparing for Adolescence was my mom's version of teaching me sex ed. Uh, and he talked about masturbation as though it was something that, um, you should pray about between you and God. The Bible doesn't talk about it, but I'm going to leave that between you and God. And I hope you don't feel the need for it, but we'll leave that between you and God. And so I just felt terrible having sexual desires because also I was taught that as a girl, it was my job to be the gatekeeper, um, that boys were going to be the ones who struggled with their sexual desires and with their eyes. And it was my job to like always keep them at bay, but with by, by how modestly I dress and not giving them flirtatious glances. And so I felt like... Uh, like a nymphomaniac in the waiting because I was like, but I have sexual desires too. And I struggle with my eyes. We're not talking about how women girls also have these, these uh, desires that the girls also lust. We are not only the objects of lust. We also lust. And I would love to see this hypothetical society where like, that's normal. And it's encouraged as a healthy stage of development. Um, I know, you know, speaking controversially, I know that there are a lot of people really fighting for the age of consent to be older. And we have these things called statutory rape and the laws change state to state on what that means. And I, I, uh, to be frank with you and, you know, at the risk of uh, shooting myself here, um, I think that a lot of these laws are very well intentioned to protect young people from being taken advantage of or pressured. Um, but I also think that there's a biological argument to be made that we are supposed to be sexually active at a much younger age. Um, I don't think that uh, we'd be going through puberty and having sexual desire and be able to reproduce offspring if we weren't necessarily supposed to be doing that. And I just, I tend to look at things through a much, through the lens of um, evolutionary psychology and just a scientific straight upness. And that's just what I observe. I have the same problem. Okay. <laughs> I look at things much the same way. One of the laws that I remember some state uh, held for a long time was it something on the long lines of uh, it wasn't necessarily the 18 years old. It was if with your if you're within four years mm. of the same age, because the issue that that they're they, they're fighting against is the the power disparity. You know, mm -hmm. you get it. Yes. You get an, a, an attractive young woman. She has no life experience to empower her against, yes. you know, the, the more predatory person who 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 does. And then why do uh, why do men insist on this uh, purity thing? I think 
is because they're afraid of competition. They're, they, the the mm-hmm. problem that they have, why they want to force women to be pure so that they, they don't have any idea, so they have no point of comparison because men don't want to measure themselves against other men. Oh, Aaron, what you just said, I think, is another very crucial component to this argument. I've had this discussion before, um, most recently on the Secular Jihadist podcast, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with. But yeah, we, we delve deep into like, why is there this double standard of men wanting pure and virginity tests only for women? Uh, it's run by two Mus- ex-Muslim guys. So we talked about this extensively. But what you just said didn't come up. And I think that that is key to this discussion because I I personally my gut is ringing right now with like yeah I think I think you're right I think that is another very important layer is to go after a girl who's a lot more inexperienced um, keep her to yourself as long as you possibly can uh, ensure that any offspring that may come are yours and be able to be a lazy lover maybe even because how's she going to know the difference? You know, we were all, I know I was always taught that God was going to bless my sex life if I waited until I was married. Um, and it was going to be amazing sex because God designed sex. He's the author of sex and he created us to find sexual fulfillment with our spouse. And I was always like, how would we know? How would we know (laughs) the difference? Because yeah. (laughs) If God is the author, the designer of sex, uh, then I have some, Awfully awkward questions for him. <laughs> oh, same, same. Like poor design with the female system for starters. Like I've always thought, like, okay, God's not. There's a, there's some design flaws that I object to here. <laughs> so in the yeah. Gospel of Thomas, in the Gospel of Thomas, uh, which didn't make it into canon, uh, some of Jesus's disciples ask him uh, what he thinks of circumcision. And this is one of only two occasions, both erroneously attributed, where Jesus actually shows wisdom. On one of only two occasions what did he where say? Jesus, uh, he says, if, if God meant for people to be uncirc, if God meant for people to be circumcised, we wouldn't be born with foreskins. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. You know, I read the Gnostic Gospels a long time ago when I was still a a more liberal Christian. Um, I I was still I was exploring liberal progressive Christianity for about three years after I broke off my betrothal until I became an atheist. And around that time, I did read the Gnostic Gospels. I don't remember that part being in there, though. Um, That's so interesting because so many Christians, especially males born in the United States, as opposed to Europe, uh, the U.S. has this obsession with circumcision. And I've I've written before about it. I've, I'm trying to find I've, I've debated whether or not to publish this is like, is this for my blog? Is should I try pitching this to a men's magazine? Yeah. Um, because it is it is problematic that we genitally mutilate males, but cry horror about female circumcision. And it's like, no, they're, they're, yeah, it's I, mutilation, I... period. I, I, I am circumcised myself because I was raised in a you know in a religiously indoctrinated society. I know practically every other American man that I know is circumcised. Again, it was never their choice, mm-hmm. and they don't have a memory of it because it happened so long ago. But you have to remember that these children go without anesthesia, mm-hmm. and there are complications. Sometimes you could end up uh, you could go off half cocked. Literally. So, um, and, and what is the, the reason behind it? And we, we I've, I've already done shows where we talk about the purpose or purposelessness of circumcision. And the whole reason is because religion can't handle sex. And so they want to desensitize men. Mm. That And that's the whole reason for doing it. There's, mm. there's just nothing mm-hmm. right about it and everything wrong, as is practically everything else that religion teaches. No, I, I think I think you're right. Um, I, I agree with you uh, is what I'm saying. I, I, I've le- I learned a little bit about the history of male circumcision in America a while ago for a piece I was working on. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. Kellogg's work and his contribution to uh, circumcision in the United States. But for anyone who doesn't know Kellogg, Yes, of Kellogg's cornflakes. Um, he he, like who knows what kind of issues he had because he kind of made his personal mission to discourage masturbation and sexual desire in in men especially. And he was a big advocate for circumcision. And he also made cornflakes allegedly to be very bland on purpose because to not excite the senses would hopefully not excite desire. 
um, which you know makes sense if you're trying to if you're trying to dull um, sensual desire, then dull all the senses. Don't don't have excitement. Don't get your heart racing about anything. Um, so similarly. This is where uh, graham crackers were not the original in the incarnation that they are now. They started as a, as a religious endeavor to make something completely bland. I think Melba Toast is in the same category where these people just try to come up with something that is as bland and flavorless as they possibly can. That's why like all the Amish dress exactly the same with no color or flair or style because they want to tone down everything. It's just like, when, when does religion ever do anything but try to diminish life in some capacity? In some, yes, in some capacity. It's, it's, it's so interesting uh, to me where you get all of these different denominations that range from like ultra-Orthodox Judaism to the Amish lifestyle to the type of charismatic Christianity I grew up in, which was very... Um, dare I say, sensuous. It was very emotive, lots of dancing and crying and laughing and celebrating and weeping. It was a very emotional, uh, sensorily engaging expression of Christianity. But do not have sex or be sexual unless you're married and only heterosexually married and it, it, monogamous, of course. And so it's And then very... we find out that the preacher is oh, yeah. snorting coke off of a yeah. off of a gay hooker. The worship ass. leader <laughs> has three affairs going on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's we we went on this like 45 minutes and we still haven't talked about the book, which was the <laughs> purpose of the interview. So, so we could probably squeeze that in here somewhere. <laughs> sure. But I also if you have time, I also had just a couple questions for for you, just because I've been listening to you on, on some different podcasts. And like I said, I just I, I really admire the way your brain works. And uh, <laughs> when you were eight to to present. Um, do you mind if I ask you just a couple questions? Uh, this is Curious. Sure, it's a little unorthodox, so yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I know, I know, you're, you're the podcast host. I should just start having my own podcast because I always have a million questions for, for the hosts. Um, so it's, I not, was... it's not a bad thing to do. It can be fun. Okay, I'm sure it's probably fun for your listeners too to kind of like maybe get to hear your thoughts on something. No, I mean, if you did a podcast. Oh. It's, it's fun. It, I, I mean, I, I talk to brilliant people. Uh, in, with doing uh, authors like yourself, I mean, there is the requirement that you read the book, which I, I have to apologize again that I could do it's to myself. Awful. I'm apologizing that I didn't get a chance to read it because I was trying to cram it this morning. Oh. Like this is good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wish I had time to squeeze it in, but but I have I have read you know, for the number of authors that I've interviewed, and it's really stellar work. And so I'm 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 happy then that okay now I've, I've finished the book I've booked the interview let's let's do that and I get to talk to brilliant people and then you could do a lot worse <laughs> thank you one, one of my one of my um bigger picture goals is I would like to do uh, a limited docu series where similar to like a video podcast like what we're doing but in post pandemic times I would love to get together with people in in person and kind of like actors on actors, but ex-believers on ex-believers is sort of how it looks in my mind. So one day and I'll be hitting you up if I do. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, it is something that I've thought about. But anyway, my two two questions that, that came up, I was listening to you and Seth Andrews talk about the pagan origins of Christmas. Great episode. I forget what platform that was on, but I loved hearing about um, yeah, your your Norse Jesus that that you or, that you grew up with and uh, Krampus. Anyway, so one one question, I've come across websites that describe um, the story of Jesus and his disciples as basically another astrology based story. And since it sounds like you've dabbled a little bit uh, with um, the different religious systems and and uh, gods and deities that we've believed in over time, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were on that. Do you think that the story of Jesus, the sun god, for instance, and his 12 disciples, perhaps representing the 12 signs of the zodiac, have you ever come across anything exploring that? And what would your initial gut response to that theory be? Well, I mean, the, the the Bible talks about how the 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 stars and such are for are for signs and for seasons. So, I mean, and, and it makes reference to a number of ages. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to quote Zeitgeist. I'm not, you know, for for anybody that says, well, they said the same thing in Zeitgeist. Yeah, they did. Not everything they said in Zeitgeist was wrong. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> you know, there are one Zeitgeist or two was things. a big part of my deconstruction, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> a, 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 big, I mean, a stepping stone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. 
zeitgeist didn't get everything wrong. There are there are one or yeah. two things in there that that are that are correct, and there uh, there is some link not just with astrology but also with uh, with psychedelic drugs. Mm-hmm. You know, Ooh, though though not probably to the degree that that zeitgeist took it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, but as far as the signs and seasons, there are references to ages and so forth, and we know that there, there are other zodiological references that did not come up in the movie, and I'm trying to remember what those were. Again, you know, it, it failing the top of my head at the moment. But here's here's a good one. Uh, it, part of the astrology uh, in Babylonian astrology, they have these. Uh, they have like uh, God, the God L, right? Who's mm-hmm. uh, who's characterized as the sun who gives light to everything. Let there be light. There he is. Uh, he has two sons, twin sons, Shahar and Shalim, and they are the dawn and the dusk. Well, now these are obviously not real people, right? Where we're anthropomorphizing the dawn and we're anthropomorphizing the dusk, but we we cast them in the in the astrology that these are twins and that the, the twins now have sons. So the dawn the dawn has a son and the son is called Lucifer, and Lucifer's name is Lightbringer because he's the morning star. He's literally Venus. Mm. So in Isaiah, Isaiah is ridiculing Babylonian astrology. In the in the tale of Hillel bin Shahar, Lucifer, son of the dawn, you know how art thou fallen from heaven? He said, like like Venus is trying to wage a, a coup against like the moon or or the dawn or something like that, and and so the sun comes, the dawn comes, and and v- Venus is diminished, so his coup has failed. You know his father was triumphant. It was never supposed to be read as Lucifer being cast out of heaven and taking a third of the angels with him. No, it was. Astrology, Babylonian astrology, it's fucking Venus. That's that's all that ever was. But wow. look how we've look look how much of Christian theology is based on interpretations of things the Bible doesn't actually say anywhere. Mm-hmm. Look how much uh, Dante's Inferno influenced mm-hmm. our notions of of hell. Right. Yep. I mean, that was that's not in the book anywhere. So if Jesus is talking about in one place, I think it's Timothy, where he's he personally will be in the physical world killing unbelievers by crushing their bodies through a bloody wine press so that the water so that the blood will be like up to our ankles or whatever around the world in in, in the blood of the unbelievers. That was the hell that was in the Bible. Not not the hell that's in Dante's Inferno, which took precedence somehow. <laughs> the serpent in the garden. Obviously, never supposed to be Satan. Could not be Satan because the Bible actually contradicts that idea. But Christians are convinced that that's what it says. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's definitely the the allegory I retained. That's definitely the the story. Yeah. Oh, very very interesting. It kind of you, you've kind of maybe want to re-explore the Book of Isaiah just for with that lens on it, that lens of astronomy on it. Um, so the follow up question to that, and then I have one more, would be: Do are you inclined to think that Jesus or Yeshua, whatever his name was, was a real human person? That uh, do you think that there's some any any historical validity to this character in these ancient texts? Well, I think that's two questions. Is there any sure, historical validity? Sure, but uh, was he a historic person? No, he wasn't. Okay. He wasn't just one. Mm. So Josephus talked about 19 named Jesuses, or GZI if you prefer, uh, and and one that was unnamed. And uh, uh, Dr. Robert Price had an interesting take on uh, Joseph of Arimathea being Josephus Barmathias, Mm. being the same person. Ooh, and and that if, when you read Luke's account of the crucifixion and then you compare that with what Josephus wrote about his own finding of he, he where he found you know three of his friends on crosses and he went to uh, Tiberius uh, not Pl- not Pilate but he you know he went to he went to Tiberius to have them have them brought down and and you know two of them lived and one of them died or maybe it was the opposite but anyway but it, there was one that was that was that was lost and so that it kind of technically is the 20th Jesus hmm. now so you have a lot of Christians who will say that that Jesus ben Ananias is their guy we know it's a completely different character but and they'll say that 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 Jesus uh what was it J- Jesus brother of James the anointed one 
you know, there's like two or three that the Christians will say, this is, this is proof of our Jesus. And I'm like, no, that, that, that guy lived in the wrong decade. This is a completely different character. We know who that is. But at some point, we, we have to think that th these people are blending their Jesuses together. Mm -hmm. And so we know that there was, what, 16 Gospels that didn't make it in? Mm -hmm. And so there's an awful lot of stories about many other Jesuses, apparently. So, I mean, look, look at, uh, look at uh, what, what, is, what is his name? I forget. Uh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was already a famous cult leader who then got appropriated so that now you have the story of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus and then telling all of his followers that now you follow Jesus. Well, then the Muslims come along and they take Jesus and did the same thing with him so that now Jesus is still alive, never crucified in, in, in Islam. And there's this one Persian story where Jesus comes out of his house every day and he heals a whole bunch of people in line and then goes back into his house. So one of these pilgrims comes in from Persia, a Zoroastrian, and he wants to find the truth of God. So he comes to see Jesus. And Jesus says, well, I am not the final prophet. The final, final prophet is Muhammad. So you need to go talk to him. So they've appropriated Jesus. And now and, and now their, their appropriation is directing them or redirecting them to the news source, which happens over and over again throughout mythology. So that's what they've done with Jesus. If there was one guy that we could identify as being the character on which most of this fable is based. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a time machine. You can go back. You've got a TARDIS and somebody who speaks Aramaic and you can go find that one guy. I don't think that's possible, but let's say you find that one guy and you bring him forward and you show him Jesus Christ superstar. He wouldn't recognize that that movie was about him. I think that if you, if you found King Arthur, uh, if you found Robin Hood, if you found Dracula, and you brought any of these guys forward in time, none of them would recognize the movies about them. Mm. Robin Hood would say, Maid Marian, who's that? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> wow. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's such an interesting way to put it, like paralleling it to all these other like uh, mythology hero stories. Yeah, no, you're right. They, they all play the game of telephone, so to speak, like through, through the ages before they get to us. Ooh. There are elements that like, you know, okay, there's a story about Jesus uh, cursing the, the, the fig tree. And that was one that I used. I said, you know, why would they put that in the Bible unless unless that's just showing the humanity, the foibles of the, the imperfections of the man. So this is something that I could trust as being reliably real. And then multiple scholars have come to me and said, well, um, well, I, I can't, one scholar and a num multiple other people have come to me to say, but yeah, but that whole thing that the story about the fig tree is actually a parable and it's all symbolic and here's what it means. And somebody sent me a, like a detailed, I hope I remembered to save it, a detailed analysis of what the fig tree story and where it all comes from. So that it all, that's actually not a Jesus story. And I mentioned that you know, the Gospel of Thomas was an, ero an erroneous attribution of wisdom. The other one is that where Jesus comes in and tells it, you know, let him with who was without sin cast the first stone, mm -hmm. right? That's not part of the original story. So how much else? How much of the Jesus story is the original story? I mean, because we have things that were added specifically to fulfill prophecy. That's why Jesus was born in two different places, raised in two different places, actually raised in three different places because he had to go to Egypt for whatever reason, just to say that he was in Egypt or that, so, that, so that others could say that he came out of Egypt just to fulfill a prophecy. And he never actually fulfilled any of these prophecies, none of them. The only thing that he filled was that he was uh, Jewish. And even that uh, is is arguable. Uh, um, there are, There are issues with with even, even that element of it because he started his own religion, among mm -hmm. other things. And so how can we use Joseph's genealogy? Joseph supposedly is not the biological father, right? But that but then you have to but that is a misreading of of Isaiah by Matthew. So Matthew said that this was fulfilling a prophecy that the, the maiden would be a virgin and she, but but that's not what Isaiah said. Isaiah was was con confirming to this king 700 years earlier that a maiden is with child, maiden, not virgin, a maiden is with child, and by the time the child can choose honey over curds, you will know that your enemies are no longer a threat to you. Well, the, the maiden turned out not to be pregnant, so Isaiah impregnated her himself and then said that the child was going to be named Emmanuel, and then he forgot to name the child Emmanuel. He named the child something else. 
So he screwed up his mm. own prophecy, which ultimately failed every way that a prophecy can fail. Because mm. by the time two years had happened, you know, the time that the, the kid should be able to choose honey over curds, the, the Syrian and Palestinian kings, I think it was those two, um, both attacked and wiped everybody out. So, yeah, so that, that prophecy failed at nine ways to Sunday. But Matthew is still misreading it into the Gospels, which are the absolute truth, because that's why they're called the Gospels. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Oh, man, you've given me so much to think about. Thank you for that thorough answer. My, my brain is like, whoa, there's so much I've forgotten and so much that I rem that I also remember, but also want to look up further um okay i want to be i want to be respectful of your time so i have one one more question. my time i'm interviewing you okay <laughs> <laughs> um okay well then uh, one more and then you then you can ask about my book or whatever um uh so from from an evolutionary standpoint do you personally think that there's a scientific argument uh, for faith, as in, do you think, uh, well, that would be two questions. Do you think atheists are in the minority because of a genetic abnormality? Do you think our capacity for faith and belief is uh, served an evolutionary advantage that makes it more abnormal to not have it than to have it? Does that make sense? There's a lot of things that we believe for irrational, indefensible reasons. It's not always faith. Uh, faith is, uh, a lot of people want to say that religion is the problem. The problem with religion is faith. And the, the, the problem with faith is, uh, is something that, that, that hasn't been so succinctly defined. It's, it's, uh, it's irrational beliefs just in general, where you prefer to believe what you want to believe, and you're not going to investigate it because you want what you want to believe to be true. Mm -hmm. And you don't even want to understand mm -hmm. if it's not true. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. How do, how do we beat uh, irrational thinking? And I, I confessed yesterday that I have an irrational belief that was pointed out to me in a conference. Somebody said that we all have irrational beliefs, and, I, and I'm defiant. I say, no, I don't, right? And until he brings up uh, you know, your respect for inanimate objects, why do you treat some inanimate objects with care and delicacy as if they're worthy of good treatment? I'm like, I have a motorcycle that has reliably served me for a decade. And I, I, I want to be respectful and caring of that mindless thing <laughs> mm -hmm. because somehow I think it deserves. Yeah. You've assigned sentimental value to it and, and reverence yeah. to it in a way. Sure. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Okay. So do you think, um, Hmm. So would you say that you that you tend to think that it's our capacity for irrational beliefs is uh, sort of an just an innate part of being human and we can all just agree or disagree on what those beliefs are? If I could summarize it, I think that the, honestly, the, in, in the course of my life and my activism, it has always come down to whether you care what the truth is. Mm -hmm. It's really that simple. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I have arguments with with people in my family all the time, you know, and not about not so much about religion, oddly enough, but as politics. Politics is huge. Mm -hmm. It's it's mm -hmm. worse, but it's far less rational than religion, mm -hmm. and they're intertwined because largely because they're both moral declarations. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. politics is way more of a moral issue than religion is because politics is actually you know, making judgments on people's lives and what they can do and, and, and our, on our liberties and so on. Yes. So when you argue with people over the facts of the matter, yeah, it looked like, uh, you know, somebody in my family tells me that uh, I'm, I'm, I walk into their house and I'm, and I see them watching Fox news as they always do. And, you know, there's uh, there's somebody up there that says that Democrats are promoting post-birth abortions. I think it was actually Donald Trump himself who was saying that the, the Democrats were advocating post-birth abortions. Okay. I say that's a lie. That's that's a that, we can prove that that's a lie. It's, I mean, it, it's not like you can go to everybody and say, and and, and everybody can say no, I don't promote that. And so you, you're imagining that there might be some exception somewhere that some somewhere somebody said that. Well, there, there has to be a data source. There has to be something they can cite where somebody is advocating post-birth abortions. Never find it. It's not there. It was pulled out of the air. It, it has no existence beyond that. Mm -hmm. And so you can't 
you know, people want to bring up the, 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 the black swan analogy all the time. You know, we, you keep looking for that one exception, but if you never find that exception, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Yeah, but now we've got two razors to look at. We've got Occam's razor and Hitchens razor. You know, that the simplest answer might be the most correct. And, and, and the one that I like is, is, you know, positive claims require positive evidence. And what is asserted without evidence may be dismissed without evidence. Mm -hmm. And then they, want, they always want to do the, 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 the shifting of the burden of proof, where suddenly I have to prove that they're wrong rather than they prove that the statement they just made is correct or has basis. Yep. You know, I, mean, I have to explain all the time. What does it mean to have... The positive claim, a positive. If I respond to you, to say no, there isn't. When you say yes, there is a God. I have not made a positive claim. Yep. I'm responding to you. I'm calling you out for the un. You know, I would accept that if I say there is no X, that I can have the burden of proof, depending on the circumstances, depending on the, on, the, on on what we're talking about. And in this case, if I were to just come out of the blue and say there is no God and it's not in response to anybody else, I have I can meet, I think, the burden of proof to adequately justify that statement. But they want to treat everything as if it's equal footing. It's it's the fallacy of false equivalence. They want to say that, they're, that, that science is based on faith and their religion is based on evidence. They'll tell any lie they can to try, to try to create that illusion rather than admit the painfully obvious facts. So when I'm arguing with these people over religion, I'm not religion, over politics and the fact of the matter, nobody ever said that they advocate post-birth abortion. Not one Democrat ever. No, Obama isn't Muslim. No, he didn't admit to being Muslim. I just saw it in a video. That, no, you didn't. Play the video. I had somebody in my family play a 17-minute video of Obama admitting to being Muslim. At the end, she folds her arms like this and says, see, I'm like, yeah, I, I just saw a 17 minute video where he never implied he was Muslim in any way, ever. So we make a watch a video again. And I say, stop it when he does it. When he admits to being Muslim, stop it right there. Mm -hmm. And so at one point he's addressing a Muslim audience and he says something about the Holy Quran. So he, a, a Muslim group asked him to speak. And so he speaks. He's being paid to speak to this group. And he mentioned something about the Holy Quran. I said, Mom, I, I wrote a book in which I mention my book. You're interviewing me. This is my book. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I mention in this book the Holy Bible. Does that make me Christian? Mm. No, no, obviously not. So, mm -hmm. but we have to, they can say anything they want to, and they don't have to have any evidence at all. They don't care if it's true. And so when I challenge them to prove that it's true, there's just an excuse for why they can't. And when I say, well, I can prove that what I'm saying is true. I can show it in a minute. Sit down on Google right now, type in this. We'll, we'll show it. We'll show from 25 different sources, if you like. We can prove that what I'm saying is true. They won't do it. They don't want to know that what they believe is false and that what I'm saying is true. Yes, because then the whole sweater might unravel because if this part's not true, what makes this part true and what makes this? And then they have to fact check all of their sources, which go to some nebulous, like a credible source, which can never be found. Yeah, no, I, I know the, the, oh, the rigidity of belief is just screams so deeply to me of just desperation, just needing, needing something to be true. Because if you if, if it unravels a little bit, your whole life and your values and everything you think you stand for risks falling apart. It's devastating <laughs> to lose your faith in anything, whether it's religion or politics. I can I have a lot of empathy for the devastating uh, ness that that the unraveling of any belief system can have. And I do think I I, I again I agree with you. I think that politics is in many ways uh, far more potent than religion just for the ways that it plays out and affects everybody, whether they believe or not, because it does affect our laws. And uh, that is deeply troubling. And you're right, they are so intertwined, faith and politics. And I, I've spoken a lot about how I, you know, in my, in my own upbringing, um, I've said before, I would not have called myself a Christian nationalist in my teen years or early, late teens, early 20s, but I was. I voted and uh, uh, engage with and, and advocated for policies that aligned with my Christian values because I believed God wanted me to, because I was very heavily indoctrinated in the whole spiritual warfare 
aspect of evangelicalism and how that was supposed to play out politically in my country. And specifically with my generation, the burden was on us to bring America back to God. And the, the insurrection uh, on January 6th was so unsurprising and yet still so scary. To, for all, how do you so feel about on, regarding the insurrection? I mean, you know that on the 4th, there's another conspiracy that that Donald Trump will be re-inaugurated as the 19th president. Oh, goodness. I haven't heard this one. Do tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Educate me, Aaron, please. What is this So I've, I've heard all these all these ridiculous uh, conspiracies, like how, how Donald Trump is supposed to be the short feather in uh, a second of Cedrus, I think. I'm, I'm trying to remember what, where, where the passage was. But, I mean, somebody shows me this prophecy where, where – Donald Trump is supposed to have a second term, but be executed or, or murdered, assassinated somewhere early in his second term, Grace but he's not he's having a second term, but they can't admit that he's not having a second term. So they can't admit that he lost the election. So they have to say that he still won the election, that it's all being hidden from everyone. Oh it, it, it's, it reminds me of when Harold Camping said that the, the world was going to be ripped in half, where there's a huge earthquake that was going to you know, dest basically destroy the planet, all life on the planet, whatever. And then when the day came and nothing happened, he said that it actually did happen. It's just that nobody noticed. Oh, man. Sometimes I'm just at a loss for words at the backpedaling <laughs> that these people have to do. I, I, so I just, I just read something just, it was just a headline. So no one skewer me if I, if the, the article didn't, didn't back this up, but the headline that I saw implied that Trump is planning to run again. Uh, and so maybe his second term is yet to come. And I bet a lot of people. It was supposed to be consecutive. Oh, it, was it was supposed, supposed to be consecutive, consecutive. Okay. so they can't accept uh, a second term. It's got to be the continuation of his original. Oh, that's just so sad. That, <laughs> that's <laughs> what, just so what sad. do you do when you can't admit you're wrong? So I got this guy oh. to give me a prophecy about the, the, the fourth blood moon tetrad or something like that, I, 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 where it was supposed to be September something years ago, two, three years ago, there was, a, there was supposed to be this, this blood moon thing that our governments were going to collapse. And, and so I'm, it, I'm talking to this guy out front of the uh, American Atheist National Convention. I'm like, so how do we know when that has happened and when it doesn't? What, what, what for sure signs? He says, we won't be able to, to buy dinner. I mean, is, is, that, is that the criteria that we won't be able to go to a restaurant and buy dinner? because this event has happened so that on that date, if you can still order from a restaurant, then you will admit that your, that your prophecy is wrong. So you eventually agreed that that was what it was. So that date came and I, and I kept his address, reached out, Hey, I can still order restaurants. You can too. There's no restaurants shut down. So you're going to admit now. So he, re he refused to admit that it's, <sighs> that it's still in, that it's in, the process. Oh, yeah, where it's begun, but the effects of it have yet to unfold. Oh my gosh! No, this 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 self gaslighting in the name of <laughs> pride, really, because you're too proud to back down, is just oh, it's just dazzling to me. The ways that we, the lengths that we will go to avoid admitting we were wrong. Oh. We all, we all do. I'm sure I do it in, in some way, shape or form. I'm glad I don't do it at the level of making prophetic claims that affect everybody. <laughs> but, <laughs> but goodness, that's, it's, it never, again, I'm just, I'm just speechless sometimes at, at these. And I do, I never know what to say when I very rarely come across people like that. It's just like. <laughs> okay. Well, this has been a bucket of chuckles, but we've been at it a while and it's going to have to end. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Alice Gretchen, uh, the, the author of Wayward, uh, and there's a link below if you're interested in, in uh, it, it is intelligently written and it is highly praised. And so please take a look and uh, where are you going to be and what are you doing now? So I'm in Los Angeles. I don't have plans to do much of anything until uh, till this pandemic loosens things up. Uh, we all know California is one of the most, I, I just read the other day, it's the last state that's not allowing indoor dining. Things are very different here than it is in Texas from my what I hear from friends who live there and from pretty much everywhere else in the country. So I'm still pretty much on lockdown. Not much has changed for me at all in about a year. Uh, I would love 
loved to be able to, um, I would have loved to have been able to do a more classic book tour. Uh, but uh, in lieu of that, I have a lot more availability to be on podcasts like yours. Um, and it's it's actually a lot more my speed. I'm not a huge uh, in-person public speaker type of person, although I'm, I'm trying to get better at that. I will be speaking at the virtual conference on religious trauma. That will be sometime in May. It's looking like it tentatively might be the second week in May, but uh, the organizers still figuring out the dates exactly. And I'm sure there'll be some sort of formal announcement. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, it's just at Alice Gretchen, my name, or on Twitter at Alice Food, which might be easier to remember than my very Polish last name. Uh, so I'm, I will be announcing the dates of, of court, the conference on religious trauma that I'll be speaking at. My talk is going to be called um, drunk high and hypnotized the neurotheology of mystical experiences. So I'm going to get into um, the neuroscience basically of what I grew up calling the Holy Spirit that other people might call Kundalini awakening. Basically, there's a lot of these um, non drug induced mystical experiences that people all over the world throughout time have had and I'll be discussing uh, what what's actually going on in our brain during these things. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>